Here's an idea. Humanity's greatest scientific achievement is the discovery of global warming. So before we get started, I want to be clear that we're not going to be discussing the controversial reality of global warming. We are starting with the premise that global warming is real, caused by people, and verifiable with data. We need that starting point in order to make some other points about the culture, politics, and science surrounding climate change. If you want to argue that global warming isn't a thing, or is an error in simulations, or is a thing but isn't caused by human beings, then by all means, please do that. Just do it on this other video. All right, so now that that's taken care of, let's talk about how the Earth has gotten 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer since the beginning of the 20th century. It's so hot! Two thirds of that warming have occurred in the last 30 some years. And we can say with some sciencey certainty that it's gonna keep getting toastier until we figure out a way to stop it. Now, at first it might seem like identifying that the globe is getting warmer is some kind of trivial thing. Like, all you do is record the temperatures every day, average them, compare them, and after a while you start to notice, hey, these numbers are getting bigger. No big deal. Scienced. But is it really that easy? I don't think so. Like strangers in an elevator, let's talk about the weather. The weather isn't a snowstorm in Tokyo, a drought in Northern Europe, some lightning in Arizona, some hail in Russia, or the rains down in Africa. It's all of those things, and a million others, from tornadoes to the San Diego-like sensation of no weather, all combining to make one huge global system. Not to mention, you can have hot years and cold years, stormy seasons and still ones, all within the phenomenon of climate and how it changes. This is the difference between weather, a kind of momentary snapshot, and climate, a broader, more complete portrait. All of these systems which fit together to make weather are fickle. They are constantly changing. Climate, by comparison, is massive and unwieldy, a portrait of weather over a generation. It's gradual changes exist on a scale too large, both physically and temporally, for any one group of people to behold directly. Climate is bigger than both the Beatles and wrestling combined. It is, in a phrase, an epistemological nightmare. And so much more than just warm out today, warm yesterday. But we love a challenge, and in our infinite desire to grok all of the things, we never let complexity get us down. We record and have recorded wind speed, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, you name it, gathered in person from sensors, from satellites, from weather balloons over Roswell, New Mexico. The truth is out there. And we've done it across the globe for over a century, which of course comes with its own problems. I mean, besides the sheer amount of data, imagine how different it all must be. The methods for recording the stuff change about as often as the weather. Sorry. Instruments, methods, political interferences, even the development of objectivity in the sciences plays a role here. In his book, A Vast Machine, Paul N. Edwards describes the process of building a complete climate picture as though you were trying to make a movie out of still photographs shot by a million different photographers using thousands of different cameras. Can we reconcile the differences, he asks? Yes, we can, scientists believe, but it isn't easy and is never finished. So once we do standardize, which is a huge undertaking trivialized massively by the mere 31 words we have time for it here, we are still left with a massive amount of data. 160 years ago, Data bytes of collected data might have been useful for cobblestones, doorstops, and footstools, but today, and I really do mean very recently, like today, we have enough computing power to turn it into something sensible and useful. We create realistic models and simulations that themselves produce climate knowledge out of just a mishmash of numbers and readings and data. We turn massive amounts of weather data into climate information. Information which is useful because it makes not only scientific impacts, but also cultural and political ones. It has influenced people to change their way of life, it has even birthed an entire industry. A whole other can of worms might be the intersection between capitalism and climate change, but we're not gonna go there right now. And has even become a kind of litmus test for a person's partisan leanings, in America at least. Though admittedly not as sexy as the moon landing, the internet, or the sequencing of the human genome, climate science and the discovery of global warming seems in perfect company. It is the product of the willing scientific participation of countless people over five generations using all manner of technology and infrastructure. It exhibits a confluence of all of our major systems, economic, political, cultural, scientific, technological, on a global scale. Which by itself would be impressive but is made even more so when you consider the gravity of the knowledge we have gained. The very future of humanity hanging in the balance of the weather. The thing we talk about when we're bored or uncomfortable. If turning that into a just cause isn't a massive accomplishment, 
I don't know what is. What do you guys think? Is climate science and the discovery of global warming our greatest scientific achievement? Let us know in the comments. And it's okay if you all want to subscribe at once, we can weather the storm. How weird would it be if the Larry Bird of video games turned out to be Larry Bird? Let's see what you guys had to say about esports. James Colvin points out that the only thing stopping competitive gaming from being a large spectator sport is the number of people involved and seems to suggest that um, as more people grow up playing video games, there will be more spectators for the sport, which is a very fair point. Viola385 and a bunch of other people point out that um, the reason they watch competitive games is not for the narrative or story, but because they can learn how to become better gamers, which I think is the sort of fundamental decision that competitive gaming is going to have to make, whether or not it's for gamers um, or for everybody, which I think is probably it's the problem that it's dealing with right now. Yeah. Relatedly, Samir Dewan and a bunch of other people point out that many of the things we claim are missing from competitive gaming are there. They're actually there. Um, and I would say that while there definitely are stories and narratives and um, helpful technological features to help people understand the game, that many of those things are put in place um, and behave in a way that is friendly to gamers and people who already know the game and not to people who are trying to figure it out or want to get in, that they are not um, exceptionally inviting. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. I mean, I've played League of Legends, I know how it works, but I still find the competitive gaming aspect of it to be very hard to follow. It doesn't feel like I'm invited in. I don't know. Maybe it's my, maybe this is my brain is broken. Cthulhu Nagan points out that movies like um, King of Kong are a really great example of what um, competitive gaming, the kinds of stories um, and drama that can happen in competitive gaming. I agree. It's That's an amazing movie. Case Duda says that while they were watching the MLG streams this weekend that they tried to choose a favorite player for every match and that their experience was greatly improved because of it. Algebra Cat makes a very interesting point and says that it is not the narratives or stories of the human beings playing the games that are interesting, but rather the characters within the game. So you are not rooting for a flesh and blood person controlling a computer, but rather the character in the fictional universe. I don't know if that will catch on, but that is a very interesting idea. To Mr. More Robots, your tweet probably just implanted itself into my unconscious, so thank you. We will use that idea for an episode last week. The Donner Party is approaching the river. What are they going to do? They're going to cock the wagon or ford the river? They're going to cock the wagon. A bold move. We're going to see how this one plays out. This week's episode is brought to you by the sweaty work of these very hot individuals. And the tweet of the week comes from Freydron, who points us towards the binding of Isaac League. It is so good.